Lord God, I just ask for your blessing upon today's word. Let your word speak forth through me and your spirit, Lord. And the Holy Spirit flow in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, to start us off, I'm going to give you a brief uh, synopsis of what today's sermon is about. Um, you all are familiar with the one verse, you know, we see through a glass darkly. That seems reasonable. But as I was kind of studying and going through some of these things, I kind of was, God was kind of showing me uh, some things in some areas that can cause us to stay seen in the glass darkly you know because yeah we may maybe we see like 10 percent maybe it's even two percent but there are certain things that will keep us from going higher and higher and being able to see more and more and we're going to start off um let me just run through real quick uh some of the seven keys or seven things so to kind of get a synopsis of where we're going with some of these things um, first one is you see part or the word of God as evil. It seems pretty obvious there. Um, not willing to wrestle with God. That's another key topic we're going to cover in a little bit. Compromising. You know, when you compromise the gospel or compromise for people. Unwilling to search out a matter. You know, unwilling to find out what is the truth. Pride. Um, another word, this is actually a word that kind of came to me, ambiguity. It can also be double-mindedness. And not willing to bear all. And, yeah, you might have some understanding of where I'm going with that. You might not. But that's kind of the synopsis where I'm going with and some of the key things um, in this video that uh, you should uh, point out if you think that's a problem. And stay tuned and watch <laughs> or listen whatever it is so in John we're gonna start in John uh, 6 55 for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him and as the living father has sent me I live by the father and so he that eateth me even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And many of therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that the, his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascending up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickens the flesh, profitable nothing. The word that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believeth not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man came unto me except it was given unto him of my Father. In the last verse here, For that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And um, before we, I start saying anything else, I do want to cover Isaiah 50, or not 50, Isaiah 5, chapter, or verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, but that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Oftentimes, um, many people want to turn the word of God into something that's not. They want to say it's bitter, it's not tasty, it's it's not healthy, it's immoral. 
something that um, I had, how do you say, a parable that was kind of shown to me from the Lord. And, and it was kind of the, from the viewpoint of these kind of people that turn everything around. And it was like, they, they finished their exam in the darkness. And then they were told to eat this body. And they found it gross. And it's like, the one thing that was emphasized was, it was the whole body. It wasn't just part of the Word of God that had to be eaten. But it had to be the whole entire Word of God. And here's the thing I've kind of learned, even in my own self. We can find certain passages of the Bible bitter, but we can find other passages of the Bible sweet. But it's, it's the whole word of God that's supposed to be sweet, isn't it? And oftentimes we get this idea like, okay, I have this part, but yeah, that's, that's good, you find that sweet, but when you find something bitter, you're not really going to accept that that well, are you? And that can be kind of a hard thing for a lot of people to accept that, okay, that bitter word, I have to learn to find that sweet, don't I? So, I'm just going to kind of run through a few verses right here. And this is more of a test. This is some a few verses I find that usually get brought up on certain doctrinal issues and I'm not really going into all those but um, this those doctrines usually have to do with salvation and all that stuff like I said I don't want to get into that that's not the point my point here is this is a test to see do you find the whole word of God sweet or do you find the whole word of God bitter or part bitter part sweet we'll see so the first word one we go let your conversations be without controversy in this, and be content with such things as ye have. For he that says, I, says, oh, yeah. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Then we go to here, to the next one, and 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means... I have preached to others, and I myself shall be a castaway. All right. So I want—I don't want to get on the doctrinal issue of these things, but I want to know: Do you find the whole word of God sweet, or do you find the whole word of God bitter, or do you find parts of it bitter, parts of it sweet? You know, and that's really the kind of the question you got to ask yourself. Because there was a point, at one point, I kind of found a certain passage, one of these passages, a, one passage, you know, I kind of find it a little bitter, it's like, ah, I don't really want to deal with that passage. But God had to deal with me on that issue, you know? And eventually, you know what, I kind of found that to be a bit sweet. And once he starts, it was starting to become sweet, he was like starting to tie in other verses that were correlating with that one verse. And so when we find the word of God bitter, it's hard for him to operate and to show us new things and to show us how it all fits together. Continuing on, the next section is not willing to wrestle with God. For this, it was kind of interesting to me because <laughs> um, when I was kind of in this section here, God was kind of showing me, reminding me of something that happened in my past. I had this, and I was like a kid, maybe eight or something like that, at this birthday party. This one little girl, was, we're both a little boy, a little girl at the time, children, and she would kind of wrestle with me because she liked me. But I didn't like her. I, I found her repulsed because she wanted to wrestle with me and all that stuff. I was like, no, no, no. I, I didn't want nothing to do with her. And oftentimes, those hard things in our life with God, we're not willing to wrestle with them. You know, when you wrestle, what happens? You're giving all your strength to that, all your energy. You're kind of breathing heavy when you're out in the wrestling mat. You're kind of breathing heavy. It's a hard thing, it's not an easy task to deal with. Alright? 
someone that actually did wrestle with God. Je and uh, this is Genesis chapter, t starting at uh, chapter 22, uh, verse 20, or uh, 24. Huh? Yeah. 20, uh, oh yeah, 32, 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. And as he wrestled with him, and he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall not be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God, and with men hast thou prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Therefore it is that thou dost ask after my name. And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place uh, Peniel, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. That's kind of interesting there. But I also want to go on to the next verse in the chapter. Because here's the key thing that I want to point out in this scripture. When he's wrestling with God, he ended up limping afterwards. He is an example of how to give us, give us our all. But not even that. But what does a shepherd do to the sheep? They break their legs, don't they? And then, after they've broken the legs, they take them on their shoulders... So what are they? They're literally face to face, aren't they? And that's when you learn to hear God and start learning to hear his voice. And uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, and the children to eat. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I meant the next verse of Micah 4. Yeah. Alright. In that day, says the Lord, I will assembly he or her that halted. You know, this is very similar to Jacob right there. And I will gather her that is driven down and her that I have afflicted. So right here, who is he saying? He's talking about, I've afflicted them, I've halted them. I make them to basically kind of walk with a limp. And this is his own sheep, his own shut, his own flock that the Lord's talking about. But he said, I'm going to gather them together. And I'll make her that halteth a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion, for hence even forever. That's, that's wrestling with God. That's learning to hear God. Um, this is probably 20 years ago. And this is just something I'm going to share. 20 years ago, I didn't know much. I, I, mean, I knew the word pretty decently for someone that was about 21 years old. But for whatever reason, I felt led to the Lord to go to this particular church that's a mega church and I'm sure you probably know what church uh, mega church that's in the area around towards the south area I don't want to give out names and all that stuff but I was led over there the spirit of the Lord and as I was kind of just about ready to walk out of the place not fig trying to figure out what what was God doing there I, this is kind of me wrestling with God at the moment. So I'm not sure what's going on. I'm not well versed in all this stuff. But as I'm about ready to walk out, I literally, it's like as time itself froze, and I just saw this sheet come down. And I'm like, as soon as it closed up, it's like this verse automatically came to me. It's like, they have made my house a den of thieves. 
And he's like, whoa, what is this? And I'm like, is this from you, Lord, or is this not? And this is, my, this is one of those really tough things that I had to learn to wrestle with. Because I've never heard anybody talk about how a church can be a den of thieves. And over time, God started bringing me different people that would start talking about this church. And God started showing me over time, it's like, this is how it is. It's not just because they have some gift shop. It is, it is going much, much deeper than just having a gift shop. They, they were basically fleecing the people. Uh, preaching a gospel that wasn't the gospel. And I had to wrestle with God because, like, okay, God, why is a church a den of thieves? And many times I don't think we want to take that time to wrestle with God. It's like, first off, was that even you, Lord? It's like, yeah, he eventually was confirming that. And he's starting to show me. It's like, this is how the church is. This is how the church is. Because I was in this, like, little small church growing up. And it's like, okay, there's maybe, like, a few kids and that's about it. I didn't have exposure to all this stuff, all this churchianity stuff. So when God wanted to start showing me stuff about how bad the church was, I had to wrestle with him because I've not heard this stuff before. And then God's talking to me about the church is a den of thieves, and I'm like, okay. I, I remember talking to one of the leaders of that church at one point. And it's like, why is this a den of thieves? I couldn't answer him. And rightly so, I didn't fully understand everything. I just knew, oh, there's the word of the Lord. You search out the matter. <laughs> I was kind of like being Jonah. I was like, I just delivered the Lord. I was going to say I was like being like Jonah. I was just like giving the word, kind of like how he went preaching. Like, here's the word of the Lord. I'm out of here. <laughs> I didn't fully understand it. I couldn't explain to the man, why is this a den of thieves? I just, I just knew it was. And so there was kind of a lot of wrestling. And when we were gripping with stuff, and this is kind of like when you find a piece of the Bible that's bitter, you know, you're going to have to wrestle with God on that. And that's where you kind of hang up. Because many people don't want to go through that process of wrestling with God over bitter passage, passages that they find bitter. You know? But continuing on. And the next part is compromising. And in a lot of the churches today, there is a lot of compromising that's going on, isn't there? And uh, we're going to go to Acts chapter 4 starting at verse 14 and beholding the man which was healed standing with them they could say nothing against it but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council they conferred among themselves and saying what shall we do to these men for they indeed uh a noble miracle has been done by them. It manifests to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. Oh, did I just skip a verse there? Yeah. But, it's, but that it spreads no further among the people. Let us strictly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Well, this name is Jesus. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And so, so often, in so many circles, we kind of compromise. And we did, it's, 
it's kind of baffling how much the world and the church are so similar nowadays. The church is sleeping with the world and the world is sleeping with the church. At what point is there a difference? You know, I was kind of been looking at a few uh, passages. And I was looking at, uh, what is it? Daniel, Jeremiah, Joseph, and Jonah. Jonah, he had his pit. It was a pit of a belly of a whale. The other three, they had a purpose. They, they were going after their purpose. They were trying to go where God was calling them to go. And after the pit of each one of Jacob and, or Joseph, I mean, got out of the pit, out of uh, Jeremiah, Daniel, they were all brought up by the kings of the earth, but it was God that was raising them up. But Jonah, that refused to speak the word of the Lord, God was the one that put him in the pit. It wasn't man that put him in the pit. God summoned that huge fish and put him in the pit. And what I found out at the end of his story, he ended up half sunbaked as a complainer. That's what compromising does. And you ends up you exactly at the end of Jonah, how Jonah was. A complainer and half sunbaked from the heat. Because you're not willing to go where God calls you. You're willing to compromise. And that's... So, bottom line, you're going to get tossed into the pit no matter what. The question is, do you really want God to toss you into a pit? Because <laughs> that's what compromising does. God will toss you into his pit. And then you're going to have to learn an even harder lesson than if you just have gone the path God originally intended you to go. Continuing on, the next uh, topic. Unwilling to search out a matter. In Proverbs... Proverbs 25, 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search out a matter. Wait a minute here. God's concealing a thing? Most people would be like appalled at that probably. But he's saying it's the honor of kings to search out a matter. So right here we often, we see is, there is already a veil there. God's concealing stuff. But he's given us, his children, the ability to search out a matter. You know, we want to be quick to judge something. Quick to criticize. We're not willing to search out a matter if they're doing something right or if they're doing something wrong. One of the best uh, things I can say to this is um, I had someone, I had done a 21 day fast. It was a Daniel fast, just vegetables, no meats kind of deal. Some peanut butter from protein. So I had a dream, I was sharing it on the internet. It's fine. I had plenty of verses, showing all the verses and all that stuff. I had this other lady that automatically started criticizing it. Now she had dreams and all that stuff, so what, like most of her channel was just all dreams. That's over 50% of it. But she automatically just criticized me because she didn't find it kosher or whatever it was. And she was actually tithing to me. That's kind of part of the reason why she came against me. She was sending, she was trying to send people over to my channel. She was starting to give me, I had gotten like $300 for tithing from her. 
And this kind of goes into compromising a little bit. But she wasn't willing to search out the matter. It wasn't until she starts like, Oh, you know, before you go to sleep, you gotta anoint your head with oil, anoint the toilet post and all that. And, you know, that stuff's actually good to do sometimes when you're directed by the Lord. But the matter was finally settled when I, started, when I revealed to her. It's like, I, I was, this was during a 21-day fast. And then she just changed her tune automatically. And it showed to me that she wasn't searching out whether this was from God or not. She was just quick to judge. And you know what ended up happening? Because I didn't want the money anymore. I wasn't willing to be to have someone that's trying to control. And the Lord ended up striking, allowing her house to be struck with lightning. Yeah. And in the process, she all her computer was fried. Her bed that she had was literally stuck in the up position. And she's like, uh, right, supposed to, it's like, yeah, it's going to cost at least $300 to get this fixed. And it's like, okay, I'm sending the money back to her. Because <laughs> it was just, just kind of crazy. It's like, you might you start giving. She wasn't willing to first search out the matter. And I knew where her discernment was. And part of searching out a matter is sometimes having a good discernment. But yeah, it's like, I don't think she listens to any of my videos anymore. <laughs> but yeah, that happens. And it's kind of sad, but we're not willing to search out things, are we? The whole body of Christ are so quick to judge something because they don't deem that their way of thinking. And continuing on... We're going to go to John chapter 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And this is Jesus speaking. All right? And he's saying, And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you have, might have life. So he's basically saying to the the rabbis of their time and what they consider what they would consider their Bible of that time, saying, Yeah, you're searching the whole Bible. You're doing really good searching, but you're missing the point. You're missing Jesus. You're not searching after him. And so many churches, they're so focused on the Bible. Don't get me wrong, the Bible is our foundation. But they focus so much on the Bible that they totally miss Jesus. Yeah, think about that. That's what the that's what the Pharisees did. They're so focused on the scriptures. They're like searching the scriptures, thinking that's going to bring them eternal life. But it's through Christ, and it's through Him, isn't it? For what is it? What is He? In John one four. For in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So how are we going to see through the glass if we're not even looking towards the light? And he says here, which I can find interesting, the darkness comprehends it not. You know, sometimes I think when you have a bright light that shined right in your face, you're not going to comprehend much of anything, are you? You're going to be kind of like, where am I? Kind of like a dead in the, in the he headlights. You know, they kind of like, Whoa! they just stop, stare, like, what's going on? And I think that's kind of how we are. If we actually saw the full brightness of Christ, we probably wouldn't be able to comprehend it. And that's why we uh, we see through a glass darkly a lot of times. is because we would not be able to fully comprehend, I think, the fullness of Christ and God himself. Because he is the light that we're supposed to be looking for and looking towards. So follow after him. But the, other, the next part here, 
And this is kind of going in where this, uh, in Philippians uh, 3, verse 8. He doubtless, I, and I count all things but loss, this is Paul talking, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Here on here, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He basically took the equivalent of a Bible degree from a college and considered it done. That's what he did. His modern day churchianity, if you will, biblical degree was as dung to him. He basically had to relearn everything in the scriptures through Christ and seeing it through his eyes. He had to learn to wrestle with God on what is the truth. I mean, he literally, he was the brightness that came upon him literally blinded him so he could not comprehend anything. For at least three days he fasted until eventually his sight was restored and he could see again. And he, in that time, I'm, it was probably one of those times in his life that he was really wrestling with God. I mean, you literally are blinded by the blindness of Christ and literally having the scales fall off your eyes to be able to see again. It's... He was... Put it, your feet in his pictures. Or his feet in... Or, yeah. Your feet in his shoes, I should say. <laughs> and just think about that. How overwhelmed he must have been. It was a game changer for him. And continuing on, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, At least I should be exalted above all, above measure, through the abundance of revelation. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Least I should be exalted above measure. What is he saying? It's like, yeah, all this, re basically God's having Satan attack him, for whatever reason. What? To hide his pride. So he's not prideful, is he? So sometimes when we're coming under attack, and we're like, Satan's really getting at me, well, maybe it's just to keep you a little humbled. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, this is three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul was one of those disciples that had a lot of revelation of Christ, of who he was. Maybe more so, I think, than a lot of the other disciples did. But here's the thing that comes with a lot of revelation and searching and knowing Geist is that pride that can sometimes beset the man. And so once we think we start having that pride starts building up and we start searching the scriptures, you know, we're searching out matters and all this stuff and we're getting like this really holy rot, uh, rolling thing going and we start basically puffing ourselves up. And then you know what? We're just dead in our tracks. We're not going any further. That pride is basically your brakes. It's going to stop you from where God wants to take you. And he can't show any more to you of his glory. And you're going to stay in that seeing through the glass darkly even more than if you didn't have that pride. Because that pride says, I've come... But the Lord says, no, you haven't. 
Brakes are still on. Look down. And so this is kind of him saying, it's like, he gave up. Think about this now. Paul gave up all the um, knowledge that he acquired, all the biblical college knowledge of that day, and he received all this revelation. God gave it back to him, in a sense. But he had to make sure his pride, the pride didn't get in his way when he did so. And continuing on, uh, the next part is going to be on ambiguity slash double-mindedness. And I actually heard the Lord speak this word to me, and I was like, what is ambiguity exactly? So I had to actually look this up, uh, or I kind of put a definition down here of what it quite it is. Ambiguity is a type of meaning in which a phrase, statement, or revel... Or, ah, statement, or re, uh, I cannot pronounce it correctly. Resolution or a so, a solution is not explicitly defined, making several interpretations possible. Making several interpretations possible? That sounds like the modern day church, doesn't it? I'm like, I was kind of looking at that, and it's like, whew, that is the church. No wonder we can't see Christ completely or anything of that nature, and the church is in such a dark state. I mean, you go around, I mean, remember hearing someone I worked with a while back, they're not even there anymore, it's like, I don't even know what sin is. And he's calling himself a Christian. What is, what is sin exactly? And I think so many people are actually struggling with that. They don't want to define what sin is. Well, okay, sin is this. Well, I don't know. And then we have this whole culture where it's like, well, God doesn't have a problem with you being gay and living the gay lives. Well, yes, he does. You're just being ambiguous about it. You don't want to define what sin is. Now, you can take that to the extreme, I know, and, like, count everything as sin, and then you're just literally, that's not where it's at. That's really the same thing. Yeah, it's just kind of like going the opposite direction. But let's, in James, chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So if you're drawing near to God's face... He's going to be drawing near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And notice that. He's saying, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So many times, we're so swayed this way or that way, that how can God give us anything when we don't even know where we're standing? At least if you're standing on something and you're humble enough saying, I may be wrong, at least God can come to you and say, yeah, you were wrong, or you are right. But if you're so double-minded, you don't know where you are standing, and you just want to stay in that state of saying, I know it's absolutely, I don't know. I, I'm just going to be whatever and live my life. No. He says, cleanse your hands, ye you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye you double-minded. You know, sin is sin. Simple as that. Going on to the next part. And this part says, uh, not willing to basically bear all. And we're going to get into a little more of that aspect of it. And we're starting at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. Bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Charity never fails, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall 
vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So we're seeing through a glass darkly, seeing in part, but when it comes, we'll see in full. And when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childless things. What's he talking about? He's growing. He's talking about growing pains. You know, when you're a child, you only understand so many things. You try to explain to a three-year-old how to operate a nuclear reactor. That's kind of the equivalent of trying to teach the... Granted, they have a great capacity to learn, but they're not at that stage to fully understand the complexities of a nuclear reactor. And so it is with us, with God, that... We're a mere child trying to understand a nuclear reactor and how it operates and how it gets the power and how to actually build it properly in every aspect of the structure. We're trying to understand that. But we have to grow in understanding. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Well, wait a minute, didn't Jacob say that? So I seen God face to face. Hmm, that's interesting. And now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. Now I want to go back to, not back, but the first part of that whole passage I was starting with was bear all things. The first thing is Obviously, okay, I'm going to suffer, and that means to bear stuff. It's not the whole aspect of it. Because the one thing I was remembering in doing all this is there are sometimes people in marriages that have not seen their spouse naked. Because their spouse is too ashamed to see their spouse naked, so when they have sex, they'll have the lights off, They'll be underneath the sheets so that they can't see their body. Are you unwilling to bear all to him? Are you willing to be open and completely honest with him? Are you willing to be basically, in a sense, stripped naked before Christ? That, that's kind of a hard thing. That means dealing with some of those emotional hurts that you've gone through. You know, that's sometimes, those are the hard things. Yeah, fine, I can work 20 hours a week at this church, but to go to God about this pain and this hurt, that's too much for them to bear, isn't it? Are you able to bear all things to Christ? Not just suffer like, you know, help someone out, this or that. But as you reveal yourself to him, he reveals himself to you. It's kind of like, you know, if you're not seeking Christ, he's, he's there. He's just waiting for you to take the first step so he can take a step. And as you take a step, he's taking a step. And then the last part of this passage here. And this is basically Moses, Aaron, and uh, Miriam. This is kind of surrounding them. And this is what God was saying to Miriam and Aaron uh, for coming against Moses. And he said, and he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and speak in, unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The 
thing I want to point out to all this is the first aspect is the way he dealt with Moses versus his sister and his brother. His brother and his sister was dealing with dreams and visions and got to that, that was a similitude. It was like giving a parable to them to see something, you know? And that is how God was speaking to them, kind of through riddles. Because the dark space, the, uh, right here, it's talking about, you know, dark speeches. Well, that's sometimes proverbs. It's also translated as, it's also sometimes called riddles. And so, God's not speaking to them directly. Well, if God's not speaking to them directly, they're only seeing in part, aren't they? Now it starts coming back to full circle here. It's like, we see through a glass darkly. You know, we see in part. But we see here, Moses wasn't like that. He spoke mouth to mouth with God. You know, if you're mouth to mouth, you're face to face. Most people don't see that connection. That's kind of something the guy was trying to show me was kind of showing me is there is something higher to go for to, to, God, to be with God face to face mouth to mouth like Moses but I think a lot of times we kind of get in that so that mindset of I'm not willing to go that far I'm not willing to bear all to Christ because that's what it's going to take it means your 401k maybe, it may be your million dollar yacht that you have to sell. I don't know. But he says to bear all. It's not just suffering, it means you're, you're coming to him completely honest and naked and humble before him. For who was Moses? He was named one of the most humbled mans, wasn't he? And God spoke to him mouth to mouth. Think about that. But to, Mo to Aaron and to Miriam, he only gave them visions and dreams in part. He only gave them riddles. He only gave them proverbs. He didn't give them the fullness that Moses had. And so these are some of the steps I hope that you will follow to help you not see through the glass darkly. Maybe you'll come to a better understanding and better relationship through Christ. And you're probably going to have to re go through a lot of this. So I'm just going to go through here and closing on this and kind of give you a list again of some of the things we've covered. You know, you find part or the whole word of God evil or bitter. You don't find it sweet. You're not willing to wrestle with God. You know. You're not willing to give all. Because that's when, when you're wrestling. You're giving it all to them. You're giving it all. You're compromising. Compromising. That's another one. If you When you start compromising... You know, the next thing you know, your values are actually going to start changing. And your values are not going to line up with Christ. Unwilling to search out a matter. Plain and simple. Quick to judge. Not willing to go to God and say, what is the, what's the story behind this? And just lay it out before him. And let him give you the answer. Next one, pride. That'll stop you. It'll put the brakes on anything God wants to do through you. That's a thing. The next one, ambiguity, double-mindedness. Basically, there's several interpretations of the Bible and you're not sure of anything. You're double-minded. You don't know what to believe. How can God give you anything? And the last thing is not willing to bear all the Christ. Not willing to become naked and humble before him. And to show you the fullness of who he is. Because when we bear all to him, he'll bear all to us. And that's when we'll be able to see him face to face.
I believe, as Moses did. Because remember, Moses, when he came down from the mountain, his face shined so brightly that he had to put a veil upon his face because he had been so close to God. Lord God, help us, I pray, that help us not to see through the glass darkly as we have, but to see clearer and clearer until we can see you face to face and to see you in all your glory, Lord. That we are willing to die to ourselves, that we may find Christ and eternal life in you, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.